So friends, we're on the way to see somebody, my good friend Stan Perkins. Stan is the son of, you probably recognize the last name, Stan is the son of the famous Carl Perkins. We're going to hang out, talk to Stan, check out some guitars, play a little music, look around, talk about history. Stay tuned. It'll be fun. You're going to learn something, I bet you. And don't, by the way, tighten up and don't mess with my blue suede shoes. And don't step on them either. So this is Stan and I in front of his dad's house. And we had a great day. Friends, we filmed for over five hours total that day. So I have all kinds of stories and I'm breaking them down best I can. This is going to be three episodes of the uh, Carl Perkins and his brothers and how they formed the group and started with Sun Records and how they added W.S. Holland, which eventually became Johnny's drummer. Stories of George Harrison, Johnny Cash, Paul McCartney, Sam Phillips, Elvis. There's going to be all kinds of stories. The things that I can break down into smaller stories will be here on this channel. Then I will put out all the rest of the stuff on the Weekly Spa Guy channel in longer versions. Some of this is firsthand accounts from Stan. He was there. The rest of it is stories that his dad told him personally. Check Stan out. He is awesome. His stories are going to pop up periodically after this first series of three. And his stories are incredible. And you are going to love Stan. Check this out. My dad's youngest brother, who was Clayton, who was three years younger than he was, uh, he, W.S., Elvis, and Jerry Lee, they were all born in 1935. But the way that they became the Perkins Brothers bands, my dad first practically begged his older brother to learn to play acoustic guitar so he could learn to pick out the melody on a lead guitar which is you can't hardly do unless you got somebody playing acoustic behind you playing the one, four, five chords or whatever to learn. To, so that's how my dad uh, started learning to play lead guitar. And your dad was a very good lead guitar player ahead of his time. Right. Um, big time ahead of his time in the 50s for right. sure. Yeah. I, 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 you know, it's ironic you, you mentioned that. I saw some uh, English guy giving a uh, on YouTube, a Carl Perkins lesson, a uh, guitar lesson. I didn't realize how difficult that it was when he started breaking it down. Because mm -hmm. I play guitar myself. I thought, good gracious alive, I didn't realize that there was, and he was playing it note for note, like on the song Movie movie Mag and uh, uh, Tennessee, or Right String Baby But the Wrong Yo-Yo. And he was breaking this stuff down. I thought, good gracious alive. Now, it was Jay and Carl, Jay being his older brother, then my dad was the middle one. They went to the youngest one, Clayton, and they said, now, if you will learn to play stand-up bass, said, we'll have our own band, the three of us. And he wasn't much interested in doing it, but he sneaked around and borrowed one from somebody. And my dad would go to his mom and dad's house, Clayton being three years old, uh, younger my dad had already moved away and he could hear him in the back bedroom just playing fooling with him and said every time I'd go he would be getting a little bit better on him. and said that he uh, finally agreed he said yeah I'll go to one of these old clubs around here at that time he said yeah he liked to party and he was into drinking at that time itself which I think probably all of them are that was that was the day, you know. But Daddy said he didn't, he had, he, he tuned two of the strings where they were loose, they weren't in tune. And he asked me, he said, Clayton, why, why aren't you got the other two strings on the bass? He said, I don't need them. He said, you don't need them? He said, no, I'm playing any song I want to on these two strings. And he said, by slapping it, he said, they're loose. And he said, it gives that clicking sound on the, on the fretboard. Okay, that's pretty incredible. So they didn't have drums. So can we see, now, is that prior to drums, or is that something that we could see in As, the Perry Como video? On the Perry Como video, I think he probably had the four strings on Okay. It, but he didn't play but the two. Okay, that's interesting. But when he first, like when he first started playing, and after he started playing the clubs around here, and probably the first session they did at Sun Records, he didn't, the two, he had two loose, so they, they'd get that percussion sound by slapping it and they would just pop. Wow. That's amazing. 
But that's, man, these guys invented stuff. That's the thing is they invented things that changed the music as well, we you know, know it. They, they stumbled on the things and they could hear something. They, they knew what they wanted to hear. I think that that was the, the genius, if it's so bad, of Sam Phillips. Is he could hear it in his head what he wanted it to be real, and I think even with Elvis, he wasn't impressed until they did "That's All Right, Mama," and then that woke well, he. That's it. That's the sound right there. And he was right. He was right. And like I said, my mom heard it. They lived in a government project house here in Jackson, Tennessee, and she was ironing in the kitchen and had the radio on, picked up WHBQ in, in Memphis, and they played That's All Right. Mama came on, and she hollered for my dad. She said, come in here and listen to this. Said, it sounds like you and your brother's playing. And he said, when I got there, halfway through the song, he said, I just kind of nodded to myself. said, it does sound like us. He said, I've been sending tapes out to Columbia, different places. Said the Packers were coming back on for turn. Went in listen to him. Went in listen yeah. to him. And he said, he said, I thought, well, if if this guy's recording this in uh, Memphis, he said, maybe me and my brothers have got a shot if we go down there. He said, when he first walked in the door of Sun Records, it wasn't but two rooms, just a little reception area and then the recording and then, of course, the, the control room. He said they had a picture of Elvis. He said, the first thing I thought, I pointed at it, and I said, uh, is that Elvis? And uh, Marion said, oh, uh, yeah, that's him. He said, I thought to myself, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> he said, he looked, he said, I had Because he'd never seen him. He'd never seen him. He said, when I saw that picture, he said, I knew what I looked like. <laughs> and he said, when I saw that picture, I thought, oh, no. No, there ain't no way I can compete with that. <laughs> <laughs> Your dad was a good-looking man. You know, you know he, he had his own style, too. That's, a, that's another thing I really The thing about really with liked. my dad... He liked to do that little dance, too. He liked to do that little dance that he, that he would do, but, you know, he became more handsome as he got older. He grew into being a very handsome man, I think. Yeah, but, and, and you a lot gotta, of men do that. you got to realize, in 53, 54... They were hungry. That's why they were skinny. They wasn't skinny. Yeah. They, they were, were literally hungry. They were literally hungry. And, uh, you know, and then the worst thing that could have happened to him was be on national television right after a near fatal car wreck of six weeks. And he appears on Perry Como's show. Ellis has already, he done sparked it and, and it nearly blew every television set up. When he first appeared on there, the way he looked and the way he moved, and 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 then my dad, you know, where television helped make Elvis, it took away from my dad. My dad looked like he was old enough to be Elvis's daddy, and he never knew what it was like to be a teenager because he'd never he'd never had that in his life those teenage years. Like Elvis had even had. Elvis had comic books. He was able to go buy records. His mama was going to make sure Elvis got whatever, whatever Elvis wanted. My dad was not that fortunate. He was born very poor, lived in Lake County. He was out in a cotton field by the time he was nine years old. The only, they had no electricity. The only uh, uh, entertainment they had, they had a battery-operated radio. And if the weather was right, they could pick up WSM on Saturday, the Grand Ole Opry. Wow. And you could, he said, we couldn't turn it on but Saturday night because we couldn't afford, we had to make the battery last as long as it would last. That was his childhood. That's, what, that's the way he grew up. And he always loved to brag, even as he, I can remember very well, that he could pick 300 pounds of cotton a day. But I, I, I've had, I've heard people that interviewed him, asked him. He said, I, he said, I knew at a young age where I stood on the on the ladder of life, and he said I was on the bottom uh, bottom rung of the ladder. 
He said that I knew that the only chance that I'd ever have was making music to get out of that cotton field. And he said, that's what I dreamed of doing. My dad bought my first guitar for $3 and a chicken. Wow. From a black man. A black uh, man that lived to himself. He said, I used to go down. And he said he couldn't play very good. said, we called him Uncle John. He said, but he had a... a a way when he would make hit a string, he would make that finger quiver on that string, hitting them old blues notes. He said, I'd love to watch him and listen to it. And he said, Then I'd listen to the Grand Ole Opry and I'd hear, you know, uh, Ernest Tubb, uh, Bill Monroe, and said, I just naturally put Uncle John's blues to those songs. And he said, I would do them. And said, my daddy would tell me, he said, oh, you ain't doing them like Bill Monroe did it. He said, you, you're speeding that up. That's, just, that, that's not the way Bill did it. And he said, my mama would tell him, say, leave him alone, Buck. Let him do it the way he feels it. If that's the way he feels it, let him play it the way he wants to play it. And he said, uh, he said I guess that's where you know, it started with me. Interesting. That's pretty darn cool. And I think that Johnny Cash experienced a lot of the same thing. And I think that was where there was a media connection when John came to Sun Records, three, about three months after my dad did. He came in early 55. Elvis had recorded That's All Right in July of 1954. My dad probably got there September, October of 54. So he was already signed to Sun when John came. John came to record gospel music, and Sam told him, said, there's no market for it. And that's true. At the time, there was he no said, market. There's no, he said, he, he said, now, I like your voice when he auditioned. He said, now, I want you to go home and sing a little bit and write something and come back. Wow. So he comes in, and he starts off with Folsom Prison Blues, just slow, and then they started speeding, speeding the song up. And then, you know, the rest is history. That's pretty cool. That's that's really interesting stuff. So I have a question. Okay. My question is, we know that your dad had the wreck going up in the limo the first time. Right. So of course he recovered. Where did the wreck happen at? Uh, right outside of uh, Dover, Delaware. Okay, so they were way up there. They then. was pretty close. So they, and that was a problem because they're up there. The family probably doesn't have the money to get up nobody, there. Nobody, nobody can get up there. So he just had to recover on his own. He recovered. They put him in the hospital. They put my uncle in a different hospital because his injury was more severe. He had a broken neck, and my dad was under. He thought that. His older brother, he and his older brother were very close. He thought he was gone, and they just wasn't telling him. And he threw a big fit. He said, I, if, if he's still alive, then prove it to me. Take me to the hospital where he, now he's, he's got a cast from here up himself. And uh, he says, but he said he was asleep, and he said he was in a room with a man that was on oxygen, had an oxygen tent and said, I heard him talking and said, I woke up and there stood Bill Black, Scotty Moore, and DJ Fontana. They had come see him. And, and Elvis had sent his regards and the hope for a speedy recovery and, and, and then also sent a telegram to him, Western Union telegram. And, and it's, it's a it's a copy of that telegram in a, in a museum that we have here in Jackson. And what is funny about it, instead of saying Elvis, they spelled it Alvis, A-L-V-A. -A. <laughs> <laughs> Alvis and the boys. <laughs> and he said he woke up and said, of course, everybody smoked. And he said, uh, he said, first thing I wanted was a cigarette. And said, I told Bill, said, Bill Black said, light me up one of those cigarettes. And Bill looked over and he said, Carl, oh. he said, that fellow next to you is, is under 100% oxygen right now. He said, Ed, he'll be all right. Go on and light the cigarette. <laughs> that was funny. They could smoke in the hospital. They smoked they, on they airplanes. Did back then. 
And he said, my dad was in the hospital, and I think Elvis did blue suede shoes on the Milton Berle show. It was the first time that he did blue suede shoes. And uh, he said, I saw him when he did it, and he said, I thought, uh-oh, it's gone. It's flying away. Here I am in a hospital room. I can't even go out and do my own song, and now Elvis has done it. He said, but... He said, you know, uh, I guess uh, it was just my good fortune. He said, my version just kept going on and going on. And, and said eventually went to the top of the charts, swapping places with Heartbreak Hotel. One would be one one week, and the other When my dad finally appeared on Perry Como's show in May, Blue Sweat Shoes was still, it was number five in the top ten two months later. His version. That's right. Okay. Elvis's version got to number 17 uh, in 56, the summer of 56. My dad's had done done its thing and it doesn't come back down. And Elvis, RCA, they released it first on an EP, which was a 45 record with two songs on each side, and Blue Suede Shoes was one of them. And Elvis's version gets to number seven, 17 at that time. And ironic enough, and I, this just comes to mind when the Beatles recorded Matchbox and Honey Don and Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby, three of Carl Perkins songs in 64. Ringo sang Matchbox. Capitol Records released it as a single on the Beatles, and it got to number 17. Really? 